observing the classic galactic nebula list from the RESC Observer's Handbook from the past century on episode 370 of the Actual Astronomy Podcast. I'm Chris and joining me is Shane. We are amateur astronomers who love looking up in the night sky. And this podcast is for everyone who enjoys going out under the stars. So have you been able to get out under the stars recently, Shane? No, I have not. My job is killing me these days, Chris. And when I get home, my energy is not even non-existent. It's it's in the negative measurements. So, <laughs> so it hasn't worked good. out well for me. But um, kind of a side note, uh, just read about the sun. Um, the So what happens like, you know, the sun goes through, through these 11 year cycles, roughly of, uh, uh, you know, sort of an evolution where the, the magnetic poles flip and uh, causes like sunspots and all sorts of other features, which results in aurora and all of this kind of stuff. And uh, we're the belief has been that we're approaching uh, like kind of that maximum point of of uh, activity. And uh, in fact, the the poles are starting to switch on the sun. So mm-hmm. the forecast is probably for about the next twelve months or so. Uh, things are going to get even more wild on the sun. So there's probably going to be, um, you know, a lot of sunspots to look at, likely a lot of aurora happening uh, on earth. And um, just in general, you know, lots of things to, or, or, you know, lots of reasons to observe the sun. So uh, just an FYI, you know, we have an eclipse coming up uh, this year in North America, or sorry, not this year, but uh, within the next six months. Within uh, the next six months, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah, lots, lots of solar things happening there. So just wanted to put that out. Cool. Very cool. I know you were looking at a nice portable telescope, which would be great for taking, uh, to an eclipse. Any, any luck picking up a four inch F4 instrument that you were looking at? (laughs) No, I, I was not successful and I wasn't super aggressive with my bid. Uh, I didn't really think I would win it and, uh, I, I didn't. So, um, you know, in, in F4, four inch Acromat, I'm guessing, you know, with my sensitivity towards like, uh, you know, edge aberrations, I, I don't think I would have enjoyed it all that much. It was more just a, a toy to experiment with, but, uh, luckily somebody else got it. So I'm not too disappointed. <laughs> what was your, can I ask what your bid was? Cause I'm looking at it now. I see what the final bid was. I think it was two. 50 Canadian or maybe 275. I'm not sure. It, right went for two, it must have been 250 because it went for 272.16. Mm, okay. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. You know, cool. and at that price, I, I think it would be a, a fun telescope to kind of play around with, but uh, you never know what somebody else's max bid is either. So who knows how high they would have went. Yeah. Isn't that your online auction site username, max bid? <laughs> uh no but maybe it should boy be. isn't that a good that's a good idea for somebody eh? <laughs> yeah, yeah that would be kind of funny <laughs> so is i'm looking at this telescope i'd never heard of it before it's what was it called uh advix av-102 ss which would you know i just know this from the numbering system seems like a vixen telescope of some sort yeah, there's not a lot of information on them. Um, they made this 102 millimeter, I think. Um, and then they also made a 120 that was also quite fast. Uh, I think it was also like a th- F3.9 or 4. And um, what I was able to gather just from the limited information out there is that this AD-VIX was like an R&D arm of Vixen. So they would do some real funky telescope creations uh, and produce like a very small number of units, put them out there and just see what, you know, the feedback was. Um, and then I, I'm not sure if some telescopes turned into like regular runs within, you know, the Vixen brand, but, um, sort of just, a an experimental wing of Vixen or, or partner company that would do some experimentation. Is it a two inch focuser on it or do you know? I'm not sure. Yeah. I, I couldn't tell the, hmm. the details were, um, there wasn't a lot of details on the auction site about the telescope yeah. other than the glass appeared to be in very well, overall, the whole thing looked to be in great condition, including yeah. the glass. So uh, whoever got it, um, I don't know if you're a listener, I, I would love to hear about it. <laughs> Maybe someone has one. Yeah. Yeah. Or yeah. If you have one, it, it would be great to hear. Uh, how yeah. We have listeners. 
we have listeners in Japan. Somebody, yep. somebody yep. could have one there. So, yeah, I thought that was uh, that was pretty interesting. And uh, when do your uh, Nikon HWs that I sent you to bid on last night arrive? <laughs> Never. I have no interest in those. <laughs> I thought you wanted to get those. No, I know you want me to get those. I want I, you to get those. Yeah, it's not going to happen, Chris. So I think you should get them. No, nah, no, nah, no. Nah. Uh, I would have to give up bino viewing, and even then, uh, we'd have to see. But well, what's going on here? Yeah, um, they intrigue me, and and you know the reviews on those Nikon HWs are incredible. And um, uh, Justin Lee, who was on our show a while ago, and we correspond. Um, he has the seventeen Nikon HW, and it's just it sounds like a phenomenal eyepiece um yeah. so you know at some point maybe i would add it to the kit but right now really not any interest yeah i'd like to meet up with justin and some of his equipment someday i say that in all seriousness um he has some really neat gear and some of it is the same as mine which i like some of it is gear that i would like to own some of it is gear that i'm not sure if i would like to own and i think that it would be really need to uh to look through how he has his uh, his stuff set up but yeah i think i'm going to try to get similar telescope as he has and we've got some similar gear and some different but anyway i think he'd be a neat uh, person to observe with speaking of neat people to observe with i think i'm going to meet up with listener tom Lopez in uh within the next couple of weeks maybe go check out his telescope making is the that's the plan this morning. The plan keeps changing by the hour. So I'm a little bit nervous. I'm going to not get to meet up with anybody because it's one of those things where the when the plans keep changing, sometimes you end up with no plan in the end. So we'll see what happens. It's getting complicated. So mm, let's do yes. it. Well, hopefully yeah. it works out. Yeah. So the plan right now is to, uh, I don't think it's open yet. That's my understanding. Um, but see, uh, Rudolf Dorner um, was uh, a friend of mine, friend of a lot of other people's as well from uh, the Kitchener Waterloo Center of the RESC. And he uh, he was someone I, I got to observe with on on probably a dozen or more occasions. And he was a bit of a telescope collector. And um, like one night we ran his Takahashi 128FS against my Borg 125. And he had lots of Swarovski binoculars and some of those um oh who makes those promenade fluorite um behemoths the 82 millimeters is that the Kawas Kawa. or Kowas Kowas yeah he had a pair of those but he had all kinds of stuff a seven inch mac newt um so I get to observe with and often like I'd observe with them like one like he would have he would get a piece of gear he would go to three or four times and usually I get to observe through it two or three times out of those sessions. And then, you know, I wouldn't see him again until he bought me a piece of gear. Almost. It was like, he would go off and be observing sort of on his own, I guess. And uh, anyway, it was really neat, but he left those instruments and, uh, and endowed uh, a, a group of folks with uh, the responsibility of starting a telescope museum. And they've gotten a lot of interesting gear. I, I don't know what I know some about it. I don't know what I can say, but um, the plan is that I'm going to go and get a private showing of the mm. uh of the telescope museum when i go to uh ontario in fact this is like one of the leading motivations for me to go um is to do that and then to get together with uh peter procure and tom Otvas, uh clark Muir, randall and a few other people um to 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 talk telescopes and telescope building and um just hang out and and have a meal together and yeah that's that's the plan anyway we'll see what comes together everybody's eager it's just getting for me going in the same direction here so it doesn't really matter to me what we do i'm just like eager to to see people get together and talk telescopes um yeah plan is coming together very slowly and unsurely hopefully hopefully by the time this airs it's uh it's all good and tom's laughing at this uh because he listens to the show but it'd be great to see him and i think i'm going to try to see a couple other people and the, oh, the other part of the plan is i think i'm going to go to the david dunlop observatory and get a tour of that as well just because it happens to be tour night there so i'm just going to go and try to tag on the public conga line and 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 see it i i had thought about trying to to see if i could arrange for that because i'm going to have like three full days Mm-hmm. where I, I can just sort of play on my own 
astronomical business in uh, in Toronto, which I haven't really done before. I've been to Toronto a pile of times, but usually, usually when we've gone, it's been to go shopping or to go see friends that are non-astronomers or see family or we're passing through or or it's something else right a sightseeing like because when we moved to ontario for a short while i i had never been to toronto before so we just see in tower and looked at a bunch of the stuff on the waterfront but this time it's it's all those things that i never did get around to doing so hopefully it comes together Mm -hmm, for sure i was out observing Tuesday evening, Thursday morning, Friday night, and Saturday morning. Oh, cool. <laughs> um, I'm up to, I think, I haven't done the official count, but I've observed and sketched 63 Messiers since I bought my 12 by 36 IS binoculars in September, early September. Oh, right on. So that's not bad. I've been observing other things as well. Though Friday night, I used them to hunt down the Saturn Nebula, NGC 7009. Did you ever take a look at that one before? It's a pretty famous nebula. Yeah, I looked at that with my 12-inch, um, mm. and I've looked at it periodically since then, but the 12-inch views really stand out. It's it's a cool nebula. I like it. Yeah, best view I ever had of it was through Peter Bacure's 25-inch mm. F47, and he had it set up in a what I call a low rider configuration, but it's a, a third reflection, which enables you to sit um, and observe through the telescope. Anyway, uh, and I, I spent probably an hour looking at the Saturn Nebula one night. It was a, the way he had that instrument set up. It's been taken apart and reconfigured now, but it was, it was almost set up so that you would point it at an object to observe the object for a long time not to really just sort of swing around the sky. 25 inches is a big scope, right? Yeah, huge. So I could see the ANSI and everything with that scope, but not really seeing that with the 12 by 36 binoculars, but easily could see the nebula as its planetary nebula, just kind of looked like uh, an eighth magnitude star. Mm -hmm. Uh, But with this exception is that when you when you were sweeping the field as you kind of moved your eye around the field, it popped out, not actually, it didn't pop out. It did the opposite. It dimmed out as your eye, uh, as your retina or whatever passed over the nebula, it would dim out. So with direct vision, it would dim almost into an imperceptible level. I could still see it, but it would dim down like about three or four magnitudes. It seemed like crazy, like maybe not three or four magnitudes, but it would dim down a couple of magnitudes, I suppose, quite a noticeable amount, almost mm-hmm. to invisibility in the binoculars. And then when you moved your eye away from it, it would it would pop out an inverted vision. And then so I had my O3 filter there because we were swapping it in and out of mic scope. And so I just had it in my hand anyway. I was like, oh, I will just pass that in front of one of the objectives and close the opposite eye and see what happens. And sure enough, it would just pop in and out as you put the uh nebula filter in front of the objective lens of, of the binoculars. It was pretty cool. Oh, neat. Yeah, that's awesome. Good good technique. Yeah, use that with the helix as well and almost could sense some uh, some detail. But I'll tell you, somebody did write me about uh, getting filters for their binoculars. I'm not sure I would recommend it because when the aperture is that small, it does really dim things down quite a bit. So you can't you can't really like stick the binoculars on and then hunt for things. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Somehow you'd want to be able to flip them in and out of the, in and out of the view, I think is, yeah, that's probably the best way. I, I don't know. Not really sure what to say about that, but it would, it would be neat to have them mounted in some sort of mounting circular things that you could just very quickly stick them on the ends But uh, yeah, it is kind of difficult to pan around and try to find stuff with them because uh, they they dim the stars out like a few magnitudes, I think. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I don't know. (laughs) Uh, uh, Let's see. Thursday morning, I sketched the uh, Eridanus Arc A, Sharpless uh, 245. That's a cool observation. Yeah. Did you see that one? It's a long strand. Yeah. Yeah, I did. Yeah. So this was something I wrote about in the... uh, First time I ever wrote anything in the Observer's Handbook was about uh, 12 or 13 years ago. Uh, they had asked for a sketch of it, but I didn't sketch it. I had no idea. So we just sort of cobbled something together. And so I feel like this is coming full circle a bit. Uh, before that sketch, I examined IC 1396, 
uh, Benzepis, which is the uh, nebula sort of extending out from Herschel's Garnet Star. Not sure if you've ever taken a peek at that one before. Yeah, yeah, I've looked at that one too. Yeah, um, very striking in the field of view. Yeah, the Garnet Star or the Nebula? Uh, the Garnet Star. Yeah. Yeah, Herschel's got, yeah, it's pretty bright, pretty red. And uh, the Nebula, though, is, I just really couldn't get happy with the view of the Nebula. So I didn't sketch it. I'd intended to sketch it, and I, I didn't sketch it. But Thursday morning, it, it was exceptionally clear, steady, um, plus three, which is warm for this time of year in, uh, in the middle of the night or three o'clock in the morning. Um, but when I swung my binoculars over to, uh, just to start checking out the field for the Eridanus arc or arc A, I, uh, I was surprised. I, I think I could see the long North South, uh, nebula strand, even in the binoculars, mm-hmm. you, you could, you could see something there. I was uh, pretty shocked at that, but, uh, I I end up doing a, a sketch through the telescope, my four inch with the 40 inch, so but 18x using a H beta filter. These are nebula that respond to the H beta filter. And this this arc A is part of the um, Orion Eridana super bubble. So if anybody's familiar with Barnard's loop, this is on the opposite side, um, but over in Eridana, so much further west. And after I did the observation, I I swung over and took a look at Barnard's loop to kind of sort of get the full experience of seeing both sides of the bubble. And uh, typically, Barnard's loop is something that is noted for being faint. And after looking at the arc A for a while and doing the sketch, uh, Barnard's loop is simply electric with light <laughs> after looking at that. So, hmm. yeah. Let's see. Yeah, it was pretty rough getting up to work the next day. Saturday, I get up at 4 a.m. and went out, and the skies were uh, were variable. Like I said, I, I observed with Mike on Friday evening. We did lots of observing, observed the uh, M31. I did a sketch of the Veil Nebula. I think it came out okay. And what else did we look at? We looked at... Uh, few other things some globular clusters m31 and uh it was it was variable so we had like these clouds that would come in and out and then uh, there was quite a bit of aurora in the north as well so i think i think the big thing for the night was the uh i'm going to have my sketchbook here was that um did some other sketches too. sketch the rosette nebula and m uh M42 that morning, and then uh, M44 and M67 uh, through the binoculars. M67 is one of my favorite open clusters. It in in the binoculars you can see almost like little puff balls, which are just groups of stars that are below naked eye detectability. Kind of looks like an out of focus uh, view through a larger ref- reflector, and uh, when you're looking at a globular cluster. But yeah, it's definitely one of my favorite favorite clusters to look at. So yeah, with those, I, I think I'm getting to 63 Messiers observed and sketched in about, I guess that would be six, maybe seven weeks, six weeks, okay. something like that. Yeah. Yep. So not too bad. Then it's going to be the big long wait here because I'm going to have to uh, wait for Leo. My targets that are left are in Leo, Virgo, Coma, Berenices, Canis, Venetici, and Ursa Major, and then over in Scorpius and Ophiuchus, and maybe a couple in Sagittarius. So it's it's going to be a bit of a, a wait. If we get a good night in November and I get a good morning, I might get some of the ones in Leo and then maybe some of the ones in Ursa Major, but it could be waiting until the springtime to, to get the rest of those galaxies when they're in a nice dark part of the sky and check out some of the ones down in uh Sagittarius and that once they rise in the morning sky but it'll be a while and I don't know about getting all those Virgo galaxy in 36 millimeter binoculars might be a stretch I don't know we'll see yeah some of those will be a little challenging but uh you never know I guess until you give it a go yeah yeah the hardest thing so far has been M76 I think I got it I want to do another sketch of it um and then M72 was much more difficult than I thought it should be. And same with M73, which are those uh, globular asterism 
on pair up in um, on the Aquarius Capricornus border. Those have been more difficult than I would have thought. I spent a, the most time looking at and for those ones. I got them like for sure I can see them, but they were very, very difficult. And I don't think they're harder. I think they are more easy to see than some of those galaxies up in Virgo. So I'm starting to get skeptical. I'll get them all, but we'll mm -hmm. see. Mm -hmm. See how many I can get. I, Stephen O'Meara said he, I think he got most of the Messiers or all the Messiers in the seven by 35s. He was like on top of a volcano in Hawaii when they were like directly overhead. Yeah, anyway, we'll see. We had a listener question, Shane. I, I dropped into the notes here from John this morning looking to sell some gear and uh, didn't know if maybe uh, you'd seen that in our show notes yet. Yeah. So uh, do you want me to read it? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so he says, hi, Chris and Shane, I'd like to ask your advice about sites on which I could sell some gear. I've reached that point in the hobby where I'm wanting to sell gear to fund the purchase of different gear. I'm a member of Cloudy Nights, but after reading their rules for posting classifieds, I feel that is not the place for me. Love Cloudy Nights, but I am not a big participant poster. Uh, can you recommend other sites a newbie can get into uh, the buying slash selling game? Keep up the great work and thanks for any suggestions you may have. So what do you think about that, Chris? Well, I don't know. Um, I would have thought Cloudy Nights. I'm, I'm assuming John is in the States. So I was thinking Cloudy Nights probably would be about the, the best bet. Um simply because and i'm not sure what the rules and regs are there but it probably has and i'll tell you i'll tell you my experience with selling on cloudy nights is i sold i think two or three things through cloudy nights um and i can't remember what happened exactly but i ended up i don't know if somebody responded to my ad after I sold it and I just wasn't as active or it might've been when I moved or something like that, but something happened and then they gave me like a bad rating or it was something like somebody thought they replied, went to the Clyde and Eights admins and then was given the opportunity to give me a rating, even though I'd never actually dealt with that person, but it was, there was some sort of funny thing. It wasn't anything that I actually sold to the person and they gave me like this really low rating like a one somehow I ended up with like a low rating. And mm. so I wrote them and they would never do anything about it. So that was my experience with the the whole cloudy night selling thing. I was pretty disappointed. I, I wrote them. I've written them like a few times over the years. And even though I've been a member and was very active for a time, they, uh, yeah, they didn't really serve me well, unfortunately, and and left that low rating in. And I think I did go back and, and dig it up and, and I hadn't actually sold anything to that person the person that I did sell the item to was somebody I had known and they, I can't remember this. There was something funny with that one too, where they sent me a check and then they asked me not to cash the check. And so finally, but I, but I had sent them the IP. It was an IP. So it wasn't even expensive. It was like $50. So eventually after some time I was like, well, you have my IP. It's like, I have to cash the check eventually. So I don't know if it was that too, that it was just like, anyway, those deals didn't go well. And then let's see, we have um, the business of Astro Buy Sell here in Canada, which I think that's sort of our go-to one here. Um, I've done several transactions on there. That's gone pretty smoothly. I know some people in the States will use that as well. And so uh, I think that goes, goes over pretty well. I, I don't really know him, but the person who runs it is pretty good. I've chatted with him several times, Paul, I think is his name, but, uh, anyway, that, that one is, is a nice, uh, is a nice site. If people want to, uh, sell in Canada, some people in the States can use it, but, but what are your thoughts, Shane? You, you do more of this buying and selling, uh, stuff than, than I do. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, I've never had an issue with cloudy nights. It's always worked out well for me buying and selling, although I haven't done, um, a lot of transactions through there. I'm guessing in the five to 10 range, maybe over 20 some years. Yeah. Um, the, uh, astrobysell.com in Canada is, is where I, you know, 
probably have done most of my business. Um, yeah. And then the other one, assuming, well, this one is actually fairly global, but it's astromart.com. Um, you can, you can buy and sell there. You may need to buy a membership, I think, but I'm not a hundred percent sure on that. And if you do, I think it's like $10 a year or something. It's, it's quite inexpensive. So uh, I think that Astromart is probably one of the bigger astronomy focused places to buy and sell gear. It, it has a lot and, you know, it, it turns over pretty frequently. So that seems to be the most popular, but, um, you know, another one too, is just the good old eBay. It's been around forever and there's a mm -hmm. lot of astronomy gear posted there too. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe I just got hung up and I, I don't, I can't recall any of the rules and rags and whatever. Maybe that's just what I get hung up on and in, in the cloudy night stuff. But I think there is something, I think there is something in there where if you reply to a person's want ad, then you can rate them or something. And, and then I don't know, like, that means like, if I don't like Shane and he posts, then I can simply say, I want to buy your eyepiece for $1. And Shane says, well, I'm not going to sell it for a dollar. And you go, oh, well, that guy's a jerk, Ben. One yeah. star rating. And it's like, well, what do you, what do you do about that? I'm not sure if it still works that way, but, but I think my rating is like, three three out of five stars or something but it's not great and it's like well that's why it is that <laughs> that way yeah. it had yeah. nothing to do with anything i did or whatever somebody just didn't want to pay fifty dollars for an eyepiece once so it's yeah i, I kind of feel a bit burned by that whole experience to be to be frank mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the the thing i do like about astromart and cloudy nights is is the rating system like it adds a level of accountability um not saying you know yours was was uh accurate it sounds like you know there's yeah. another issue there that uh was at play but um you know when i'm buying like expensive gear uh i will only buy it you know on say a site like astromart from mm -hmm. somebody who has a lot of transactions and, and a positive rating yeah um, you know just yeah. makes me feel a little more comfortable so i, I do appreciate sites that have that in play yeah, I really wish they would uh, they would go ahead and fix that. If if anybody's listening from Cloudy Nights, I have written them in the past, and they wouldn't they would not budge on it. And mm -hmm. I was like, I I think yeah, it was like two things. Like one where the person didn't want me to to cash the check they had sent me for an eyepiece I had sent them, and then I think the other was somebody had replied or had thought they replied and had asked the admins for the ability to give me a rating. So they gave me like this poor rating that the admins allowed them to do. And I was like, but I never even really talked to that person, I don't think. Or they, or maybe if they had sent like a really low, like bid, I was like, you only you sent me a bid for a dollar on a $50 IP. So I'm not for a dollar. Mm -hmm. Why would I do that? So mm -hmm. that's my experience with Claudia Nights. But yeah, for me, yeah, it's the Astro Buy Sell. Um, I had a few hiccups with that, but I won't go into them because they all get sorted out. So in the end, I was sort of a happy uh, camper on that. So it's kind of where I've been buying and selling anything. I've met some interesting folks through it too. Same with on, I've never really had too much of an issue with Astromar as well, but anywho. Anything else with buying and selling gear? Shane, you're... You're a big uh, buy EE person as well. And that's where I've been buying some things in recent years. That's been fun. Yeah. Yeah. That's a decent uh, resource for, you know, different gear. I, I find uh, you can get some, uh, some items that you don't normally see here in North America, like the, uh, the Pentax um, SMC orthos, uh, the 0.965 mm. inch. Those ones pop up on there somewhat regularly. Um, you know, a lot of Vixen stuff that, you know, sometimes we have over here, but sometimes we don't. Uh, yeah. So it can be another uh, decent place to find stuff. Although I don't, I don't find that you really get any bargains. Like you will pay full market price or maybe even a little bit more than what, <laughs> what the market might be dictating because it, it gathers a lot of interest from people all over the world. Yeah. Good stuff. So ready to move on to this, this, I feel like this is a little bit of a weird topic, this business of this old galactic nebula observing list that I found in the old observer's handbook. <laughs> I mean, it might seem like a strange topic, Shane, but uh, I've been I've been kind of investigating this list again and doing some observing off it. It's been kind of fun. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm interested in this list. I don't know a lot about it. So um 
carry, carry on. Yeah. So what happened was back in 2018, I was going to be part of a panel discussion over at Calgary um, on the 150 year history of, of the RESC. And I'd been asked to speak a little bit about observing styles was the topic assigned to me. And, and during that research, I ran across, uh, I decided to go through and look at the observer's handbook. So the RESC, the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, produce, has produced an observer's handbook sort of off and on every year, more, more years than on. I'll, I'll get to them in a second. But I think something like in the first hundred years, they produce like 95 editions um, since 2012. And what what it encompasses is, you know, just like your what you can see, you know, month by month in the nighttime sky and has different articles like some on nebula filters, solar eclipses, lunar eclipses, brightest stars in the sky, uh, different things of that of that nature. And from year to year, there are small changes. Often the complaint is that it never changes, but that's definitely not true. Uh, it is slightly different every year. I, I put an article um, in each year uh, that I collaborate on with Randall and whoever the editor is. And uh, and so it's a fresh article that we put in every year. But over the years, they put in different uh, lists. And going through the old handbooks, I noticed this uh, old list. So um, in the early years, the first edition was 2012 to 2017. And then I think they stopped for a couple of years. But uh, they had a section in the Observer's Handbook called the Constellations. And by the way, all these old Observer's Handbooks have now been digitized uh, thanks to uh, our volunteers at the RASC. So you can go and, and just Google RASC um, Observer's Handbook Archive or something of that nature. And you can go and look at all the Observer's Handbooks for like the first hundred years. I think there's 90 in the first hundred years or something like that. So in are, 2020... Are... Go Sorry, ahead. Chris. Are are they digitizing the current ones too? I don't think so. Mm. No, no. I see. That's too bad. I really wish they would release a uh, like a current, you know, observer's handbook uh, as a digital version. Um, but anyway, uh, they they maybe did. At some point they, will. they they did do that, and it was unsuccessful. Hmm. Yeah, it turned yeah. out that there's there's a, a handful of people that want it and will use it. And then most people wanted the physical copy for a variety of reasons. Hmm. So I can kind of get access to much of it digitally, um, which is nice. Um, but uh, it was, yeah, it was one of those things where the, the demand was loud, well heard, and they did put it out for three years in a PDF. Did you ever use those? I didn't even know they did it. Yeah. Uh, otherwise and, I would have, or I would yeah, have paid for it too. Yeah, I know. And it's like one of those things where they did put them out digitally and uh, they, uh, they, there wasn't the uptake for whatever reason. I <laughs> don't know why I could be getting this wrong. Dave Chapman will write in and correct me, but they, they did have them available for a short while or you could get it or something like that, or maybe it's just talked about, but anyway, I'm not going to, that's a rabbit hole. Sure. Um, they put out in 2012, 1912 to 1917. So this is like just over a hundred years ago, uh, a section called the constellations in the observer's handbook, which is really nice. Really like this. It was basically a beginner's guide to the night sky, including four charts, beautifully drawn charts down to fifth magnitude and descriptions uh, of the constellations visible in Canadian skies. So down to about like uh, for 40 degrees um, latitude and north. And they even put in uh, most of the messy objects. M42, M31, prominent star clusters like the double clusters, Hyades, many double stars um, were marked through the charts. And uh, then they, they had text with like brief descriptions of all these targets. And I was like, this is fantastic. I, I kind of wish that we could still do this. And these charts are pretty good. I think I would draw them a little bit differently now that, you know, I don't know whether it was a cost cutting thing, but like Orion and Gemini are just like boxes and some of the other constellations. They're either a straight line, a box or a triangle. That's what a constellation was back in a hundred years ago. But I, I don't know. I, I think the charts are really good other than that. And then 
because these were put out before they had the official boundaries, um, they just kind of drew in dotted lines around the constellations just wherever it fit. Uh, but they're quite well done. And then across the top, they had the months um, marked where the uh, area would culminate uh, at the meridian in the nighttime sky and the evening sky. So uh, quite well done. Uh, but then in order to save costs, they uh, they cut this section out and they would mention like the messy objects and some other targets. Uh, but it wasn't until 1937 that the list of 103 messy objects were put in the observer's handbook. Because remember, do you remember the business with the 103 objects from the messy list? Do you remember what that was all about? No. Like in Messi's works, like he released two versions. I think the first version of his catalog was up to Messi 45. And then the next one went to 103. So you have to keep in mind that when Messi was observing and making his lists in, in the late 1700s, the idea of symmetry was different from what it is today. Today, we like everything to be in like fives or tens or even numbers or whatever. But back then, his sense of symmetry was 45 was a nice round number, right? Mm -hmm. 103 was a nice round number. So uh, what it boiled down to was that he didn't include some of the later observations um, for whatever reason in, in that second publication. But there was correspondence. And the person who uh dug those out was uh i believe helen sawyer hogg and uh and she she was uh, a member of our organization and then there was like later on some uh some descriptions of some of these uh, later on like uh messy 104 which is of course uh which object do you remember which 104 is mm, no i don't the sombrero galaxy down there oh right at, yeah, yeah at the bottom of uh sort of on the corvus uh virgo border and then uh uh 105 106 107 108 you know 109 and then 110 of course up there in uh by m31 so there was correspondence that uh, she eventually dug up and and uh uh, what was his name? Gingrich and a few others had sort of corresponded in in some of the you know, popular publications uh, about. And they they eventually uh, each ended up adding two or three objects on. I think one of the other people was uh, Ken Glenn Jones was in on this as well, and and they had added in a few of the other uh, targets. Um, but they they ended up putting these hundred and three messies in in 1937, and they stuck around for five years. But they weren't, um, it wasn't that popular, apparently, uh, because in 1943, uh, Charles Chant, who was the Observer's editor, Observer's Handbook editor, um, Fred Hogg and Ruth Nor Northcott um, were singled out um, for their contributions. And they came up with um, this idea of breaking things down into essentially nebula clusters and galaxies and then presenting a list of those type of targets which uh you know was sort of an interesting thing to uh go and take a take a look at sorry my neighbor is driving um he does some heavy heavy machine work he's quite good he's backing up a giant trailer using a tiny front end loader it's uh it's a pretty interesting sight to have here this morning all right so these three tables included some introductory uh, passages, but they, they got away from putting all of messy objects in. And I'm, they don't really say why, but I think they were just trying to give more of a focus on the different types of uh, objects that are there. So in star clusters, they talk about the star clusters um, for that observing list was selected to include more conspicuous members of the open and globular cluster variety. And then they talk about galactic nebula or what we now just call nebula. And these galactic nebula were, were listed and and selected to include the most readily observable but also being representative of uh, planetary nebula such as the ring nebula and lyra and diffuse nebula like orion and dark absorbing nebula like the coal sack and then they talk about extra galactic nebula do you know what extra galactic nebula are Shane? uh i believe that's nebula outside of the milky way but maybe i'm wrong it's confusing. I mean, it is, 
but we now call them galaxies. <laughs> so oh, yeah, yeah. it it shows you what change what has changed though. That was in uh, 1943. So that that is a good idea of some of the major changes. Like we we can scarcely understand what that means without actually like I've read the definition. That's that's what I know. But if I was asked like I just asked you, which is unfair, I know, but. I, I would have thought the same thing. Extra galactic nebula. Well, that must be like some nebula that are like in M33 and M31. And those must be the nebula. No, because yeah, it hadn't been fully, uh, the language hadn't been fully changed since uh, Hubble and, and, uh, and others had uh, discovered that the, these nebula were, uh, were actually galaxies of their own, right. Which was known for, you know, about 20 years at, at that time, but the language just hadn't uh, totally caught up, like especially in the amateur circles. So um, th- they ended up coming up with 25 star clusters of both open and globular cluster variety, uh, 24 galactic nebula, or what we call just nebula today, including dark nebula, and then 25 extra galactic <laughs> nebula, which we just call galaxies today. And uh, these objects ranged, and, and this was the interesting part to me, some were extremely easy and many are extremely challenging, uh, representing all different types of objects and covering uh, the entire sky. So you need to pack your bags and head south to see them all if you want it. So it was uh, a, an interesting set of lists uh, for the sort of global traveler as well as uh, people that are interested in seeing a good selection of all the different things that are out there. So they included lots of the... Uh, the objects from Messier list, from the Messier list. And they also included a lot from Barnard's Dark Nebula. Hmm. And uh, I was surprised to see some of the things they uh, they took a look at, which was like the horse head, uh, the snake. So B33 is the horse head, Barnard 72, B72 is the snake dark nebula. Those are pretty challenging nebula especially in 1943. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Hubble's variable nebula, as well as the North American nebula are in there. And uh, they they eventually did begin including the Messier list uh, later on in the Observer's Handbook in in the 60s or so. Um, But this this classic list of these different types of objects uh, remained until 1981. And um, it was really neat. They had uh, 35 objects uh, with the clusters and 62 galaxies um split into the brightest uh, to nearest so it was kind of neat um i was just really interested to see like they moved away from that messy uh list and they were just trying to illustrate the different types of interactions between the stars and inter- interstellar matter in our own galaxy and really kind of appealed to me as uh, many of the objects in like the messy list are pretty small and good for narrow field instruments uh, but they were really trying to uh, create a better contextual understanding of of the nebula story. Um, And they even included some interesting targets, which aren't individual targets, like extended complexes and wide field regions like the Rho Afyuki and uh, Delta Afyukis dark nebula region. uh, We now commonly refer to as the pipe bowl. So you've you've probably seen the pipe bowl uh, from the grasslands or other dark sky sites, eh? Oh, yeah, multiple times. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so they included targets like that, which I thought were uh, of of great interest, simply because they are good examples of dark nebula that uh, that you can see. And I eventually put uh, some of these, uh, sort of coincidentally enough, I'd, I'd put in the Observer's Handbook some years before as com- complexes. And uh, I remember at the time when I was doing working on that list with Dave Chapman, we, we had a discussion about what a complex is. And I, I had to assure him that this was an, an appropriate designation. And then I was really happy to see that I, I wasn't the first person to ever put, you know, uh, observing complexes in the observer's handbook. So that was kind of neat to uh, to see. So just take a look here at some of the targets. So now this section here, the thing I like about the, the nebula section is all of these are visible from uh, North America. So you don't have to go traveling, but the star clusters and the galaxies, um, th- th- some of them are in the Southern hemisphere. So I kind of just sort of singled this section out as, as a bit of an observing list. And because it is uh, nebula and it's always fun to look at nebula 
apart from just the clusters and, and galaxies that are up there. So some of the uh, objects that, that we can see now are like M76 and Perseus. Um, I've done a few sketches of that recently. One I haven't seen before that's on my list to take a look at is IC348, which is um, a reflection nebula around a cluster. Not sure. Have you ever seen that one before? I never have. Yeah, I don't think so. They uh, talk about the Merope Nebula, of course, up in the Pleiades. And then uh, NGC 1535, which is, uh, I think it's called Cleopatra's Eye in Eridanus. I think I've seen that, but uh, I'm going to take a look and try to do a sketch of that this autumn. And then Messier 1, of course, because uh, it's a supernova remnant and a crab pulsar. One of the things to note when you're looking at these old lists is like the types are are different than what we have today. Although SN, supernova remnant, they'll put P1 for PL for a planetary nebula and then uh, REF for reflection nebula. And some of the things have changed because they refer to some objects as protostellar nebula. And some of them I don't think, I think we just call them H2 regions now. They have H2 regions as well, but I don't know if some of these are truly protostellar nebula. And then some of the things and the designations have changed. So they refer to M42 as an H2 region, the Orion Nebula, which we still do. And then NGC 1999, which is a, a reflection nebula that is listed as a protostellar nebula. And uh, then they, they talk about Zeta Orionis as a complex of two degrees. So, and it says, including the horse head. So not just talking about um, observing B33, the horse head, they're talking about like the whole two degree area around which contains NGC 2023 and 2024 and a few others. So I, I like that idea of observing like a whole little region uh, through through a smaller instrument. Uh, talk about M78. And then uh, this one here is pretty tough. Um, I've, I've never had a good observation of it yet. IC443, which is a supernova remnant up in Gemini, it tends to be more photographic. The jellyfish nebula is what I think people would more commonly uh, refer to that as. You've probably seen photos of that before, I imagine. Oh, yeah, definitely. And then uh, this one kind of got me because I was observing these the other morning. I got I was trying to do some sketches of these. Uh, NGC 2244, they refer to as the Rosette Nebula, but that sticks out to me and, and should for other people because I think the designation of the nebula is not 2244. I think 2244 is the cluster, not the nebula, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I'm not too sure. And then they talk about 2247, as a protostellar nebula, but I think they mean 2253 because that's the, I think the star forming region 2247 is a small reflection nebula that is just, uh, that is just off of uh, one of the stars, but maybe they don't, but I, I think there's some mix up with some of these, these ones. So I think by simply seeing the, the rosette uh, cluster, I think they were just trying to say cluster and nebula. I'm not sure why they they might have pulled out uh, that. So it's a little bit of a gray zone. And then uh, they talk about NGC 2261, which is Hubble's Variable Nebula. And then 2392 in Gemini, which is the uh, Clown Face Nebula, has some other names associated with it. Man, have you ever seen that uh, Clown Face Nebula before in a big scope? That is something else. Not in a big scope. I may have looked at that with my 12 inch. Um, so, you know, moderate, uh, moderate, big aperture, but uh, I don't think anything bigger than that. Yeah. We spent a night looking at that in uh, my friend's 16 inch once. Really nice. Uh, M97, Al Nebula is there. Um, the uh, Pipe Nebula is there. The Rower Fiku Nebula is there. Lagoon and Triffid. Cat's Eye Nebula, um, the Eagle and the Swan, the Ring Nebula are there, uh, the, um, the 6826, I think, which is the uh, Blinking Planetary Nebula up in Cygnus is there, and uh, M27, the Dumbbell, uh, NGC 6888, which is the Crescent Nebula. I'd like to take a look at that. Need to get Mike's scope on that one. Gamma Cygni region, that's quite nice, and the... Uh, Cygnus Loop, they call it. We now call it more commonly as the, the Veil, North American Nebula. Saturn Nebula is in there. Um, NGC 7023 up in Cephas and 7027 in Cygnus. Uh, 7129. I haven't looked at this one before. It's listed. 
as a reflection nebula in their list, but then it's called the small cluster, which you think is just like a descriptive name. But this unofficial sort of common name for NGC 7129 is the small cluster. If you look it up in software, you can type in small cluster and this one up in Cephas will pop out. 7293, the Helix Nebula is there. And then the uh, Planetary Nebula up in uh, Andromeda, 7662 is there. So it's a really neat list of targets, which include bright nebula that are fluorescing on their own, uh, reflection nebulae. It includes nebula that are associated with clusters, uh, star birth, um, planetary nebula, and supernova remnants. So I just I just think that that is a really neat list. And if anybody wants to check it out, you can just go to rasc.ca um, handbooks or handbook, uh, or you can just Google RASC um, handbook archive. Uh, or RASC Observer's Handbook 1980, or any of the ones between, say, uh, I think 43 and, and 80. And you'll be able to find that free on the internet for people to take a look at. Right on. So that's kind of a, the the list that I've been thinking about observing for a while, since 2019, I suppose. And then now I'm kind of finally getting around to it now that I'm running out of these messiers to to look at. I just, many of these I, I've seen before, but I think it'll make a, a pretty neat project maybe for for the next year to try to get some, some good sketches of. Yeah, well, you know, I'm sure you've looked at a number of those already, um, you know, so that helps and then add a few more to the list. Yeah, just thinking... I wonder what the most interesting out of all these that I'd I think the horse head is going to be the the toughie. I haven't seen that in a few years. So I got to get back around to that. And then they did list the pulsar in the crab. And I've only read a handful of comments. One of the things, do you ever do you ever read about anybody seeing the pulsar in the crab nebula? No, no, I haven't. There's there's been these strange reports. You can you can look them up. There was a person uh, who was at a public observing event at like Harvard Observatory or something some uh, some time ago. I forget. It might have been fifteen or twenty years ago. And and when uh, she stepped away from the IP, she said, uh, "Why is it flashing?" And uh, they said, "Oh, it's not. That's just the seeing. It's scintillation." She said. That's not scintillation. She was turned out she was an airline pilot and uh, she knew scintillation when she saw it. And she said, no, no, it's flashing at this regular pulsation. She didn't even know what she, she was necessarily looking at so much. She wasn't an astronomer. And uh, they, they noted it down. And then later on, it, it came to light that she had probably uh, a very sensitive vision and was actually able to see those pulsations. And if you look, you can actually see uh, the, you know, sort of like one in 10 people or something are actually able to see the pulsations of light in, uh, in Messier one myself. I've never seen that. <laughs> I don't mm -hmm. know about you, Shane. No, no, I haven't. Um, uh, you know, I've never even tried to be honest, but, um, even just sort of casually catching a flicker. Uh, I can't say that that's ever happened to me. Was it Mel Bartles that talked about somebody taking, an apparatus that would pass in front of the eyepiece and then seeing the pulsation of the crab. One of our guests mentioned this, or I was reading it somewhere. I can't mm -hmm. find my source though, but somebody had made a device and when they went to, I think Mount Wilson or somewhere and they, they were looking through, I think the 60 inch there, they, they were able to, uh, to isolate the, uh, the, the, the pulse or the brightening or somehow they were able to see the, the uh, the pulsar, but I think that's pretty tough. So I think that is a bit of an error in this in this list as well. I don't I don't think seeing the pulsar is something that you can necessarily put in a in a very easily doable list. You would need to go to some some great lengths. So just seeing the supernova remnant is fairly easy, but seeing that pulsar, I think, uh, requires either a a very very particular person who has the capability to see at that frequency or to create a pretty uh, sophisticated device to attach to a fairly sophisticated telescope in order, in order to see it. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe someone will write in and correct us. Mm -hmm. 
Hubble's variable nebula. I can't, I think I've seen that through other people's telescopes. I haven't looked at that myself. And yeah, everything else I've seen, haven't sketched. I've been observing the Gamma Cygni region. Haven't done a sketch that. I did a binocular sketch of the North American and Saturn Nebula. I did see through the binoculars, but we had trouble getting it in the telescope. It's just, it's really badly placed for like Mike's reflector has a bit of um, stiffness. Like when you're at like a 30 degree up angle and we're having trouble getting, um, getting it i think for for that reason alone like we both tried just couldn't get it we we can we know where it is like we can find it in our binoculars but uh, getting the telescope aligned to it and star hop to it proved to be a little bit of a challenge so yeah there's that and the helix yeah i did a sketch of that last year that small cluster i really want to see i feel like that's like a fairly easy um target and it's it's like what is it 10th magnitude I don't know. We'll see. We'll see what that one looks like. Hmm. Should be good. So do you have any uh, observing plans for, for the autumn? Or are you just trying to survive the uh, work-life balance? Uh, yeah, a little bit of the work-life balance. But um, yeah, you know, I'm hoping to get out as much as I can, as much as uh, the skies allow, and take advantage of what looks like, you know, could be some seasonably warm temperatures uh, when we get into November, December. So um, yeah, we'll just see how it comes. Yeah, fingers fingers crossed. I'm hoping to the long range looks like it warms up slightly around the weekend of the sort of third, fourth, fifth kind of thing. And yeah, I'm hoping to uh to get out and do some maybe some more of these uh, targets at that time. See Cygnus is directly overhead in the evening sky right now, which is awesome when you're Mike Mike, Mike took a lawn chair and put it like totally horizontal and I was lying in it looking at uh, the Cygnus region, which was fantastic, but it's very difficult to point a telescope into that region right now and until it starts coming down in the evening sky here in the coming weeks. And then uh, I don't know how I would be able to sketch that lying on my back. This, I don't know. I can see myself like dropping uh, my inky pens on my face and stuff like that. But uh, anyway, we'll, we'll see how it goes. But I think next, next month, hopefully we continue with this slightly warmer weather. I don't mind observing down to minus uh, 10 or minus 12 is totally fine, but once it gets too much colder than uh, minus twenty, with or without the wind chill, uh, I I prefer to uh, to keep the sessions pretty short, and we'll focus on looking at some of those uh, moon planet pairings that we talked about uh, in the objects or the uh, observers calendar for November. So that might be my focus in the end. Yeah, right on. All right, dear listeners, please subscribe and do us a favor and share the show with other stargazers. You know, you can always send us your show ideas, observations, and questions to actualastronomy at gmail.com. Thanks again for listening, everybody. Thank you, everyone, for listening, and we hope you enjoyed the show. If you are interested in more information, would like to contact us, or if you would like to support the podcast, check out our website, actualastronomy.com. <laughs>